Welcome to the Nerd Stalgic Podcast with your host, the Ginger Howdy beans, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Nerd Stage at Podcast. I'm your host, Luke the Human. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're all good, as per usual. Before we get into today's wonderful, incredible topic, I'm going to do a bit of housekeeping, because I like to keep my house nice and clean. So, three important things I want you to do for me before we get into today's video. Number one. If you're not following me on Twitter, please go follow me on Twitter at nerdstagic underscore pod to be kept up to date on everything and anything that I'll be doing. Number two, if you listen to this on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Most importantly, a like and a comment. A subscribe is wonderful, but the way the YouTube algorithm works is that if you leave a like or you leave a comment, that the video will be seen more by more people in the algorithm and it will be pushed up and then more people will see the channel and want to subscribe and listen and it will grow. So, If you can do those two things for me, that'd be wonderful. Also, finally, if you're listening on Spotify, don't forget to leave a rating if you haven't already. If you listen to this on your mobile and you haven't left a rating, just go to the top of the Nerdstalgic page on Spotify click the star, and then you'd be given the option to rate between one to five stars. Again, it works exactly the same as YouTube, that the more um, stars, the more ratings you get, the higher the rating, the more that you are pushed up the algorithm, the more people get to see you. So again, if you do those three, three things for me right at the beginning, I will be eternally grateful. So on to today's topic. So today we're going to be talking about the 2018 Tomb Raider movie with Alicia Vikander. Um, to be honest with you, I, 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 from the memories I have of this film, uh, I've only ever seen it once, but it stuck with me. It's one of them films that is so good that, it, that I can't wait to see what the character does next. Um, and especially how when I remember hearing about the movie was going to be based off the uh, reboot video game, which I think came out in 2012, 2013 by Crystal Dynamics. And absolutely loving and adoring uh, that game and that story, and I'm hoping to cover those games eventually in the future, um, that knowing that this movie was taking kind of parts from the story of that game, which I loved, and then putting it into a movie, sounded absolutely fantastic. So I'm really look, looking forward and excited to be talking about this film today. Also, I had the incredible positive response I've had to uh, my review of this series so far. So, so far I've Uh, reviewed the first two Tomb Raider movies with Angelina Jolie, Um, Tomb Raider and then The the Cradle of Life. Uh, The Cradle of Life is actually doing absolutely incredible. If I go onto YouTube now quickly, but last time I checked it, it was about 800 and something views. Currently, it sits at a whopping 924 views being my most successful episode ever, either on YouTube or Spotify. I've never had an episode that's ever done this well, and it's still growing by the day. And I don't doubt it by the time that this review comes out, there's a high potentiality that that film, that review, should I say, sorry, um, will be at 1,000 views. And I don't know how or is why, but I'm glad it, that one was so successful. So the the response has been incredibly positive, um, especially to The Cradle of Life. A lot of people are going back and watching it and actually realising it's a better film than what they remember, um, which is good. When I'm glad. I've had a lot of people message me being like, I've listened to your review and I've, I've gone back and watched it and I've actually really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for talking about it. And I like it when people, um, you lot, do that. You know, it's nice to know that a movie or game or book or whatever it is that I talk about, people have then gone, you know what, I like what he's saying, I'm interested, I'm going to give it another go. Um, and it's 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 really lovely and heartwarming for that. So I just want to say thank you for those people that have left comments or sent me feedback or messaged me on Twitter or Discord, just saying, like, you know, they liked my review and that um, they've given the movie another go. Because, again, it's it, especially with The Cradle of Life specifically, that movie deserved a second chance. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't remember it. I didn't remember it. Then I went back and watched it and I actually thought, found out it was a lot better movie than what I remember. Um, so, yeah, definitely keep them coming. If there's anything I talk about here on the podcast and that, you know, I convince you to go watch it or change your view or, or anything like that, really, or, if, or even if you'd want to say something negative, um, 
I'm always open to feedback. So I want to say thank you to everybody for the positive response that we've had um, to this series so far. It means a lot. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so on to the sort of movies cast. So we have for this film, uh, Alicia Vikander as Lara Croft, Dominic West as Richard Croft, uh, Walter Goggins, who is like, I've always been a fan of Walter Goggins. I've been a fan of him for years, even before he was like, a big star. I always knew that he was such a talent. And like now everybody knows him from the Fallout TV show. Um, and obviously he was in this movie. He plays a villain as Matthias uh, Jogel. Um, absolutely incredible villain. He, he's such a talent. And uh, I'm so glad that he's finally getting sort of the recognition that he deserves from like, obviously playing the ghoul in Fallout. Um, but yeah, Walter Goggins in this movie. Uh, Daniel Wu as uh, Lou Ren. Uh, Christine Scott Thomas as Anna Miller, uh, Derek Jacobi as Mr. Yaffe, uh, Alexander Wilmo as Lieutenant, uh, Tama Bakwi as the mercenary. And then you have all these other characters that are just mercenaries and so on and so forth. Um, but I am, I remember when I watched this and I saw that Walton Goggins was in it. And I think that's what sold me on it the most at first. And then I heard it like, oh, we've, we're basically. Uh, taking the story from the game and we're retrofitting it for a movie. Uh, those two things got me really, really excited. I remember when the first trailer came out and it just, it felt like Lara Croft, but also it felt like a modern Lara Croft. It felt in the vein of, of the games. And Alicia Vikander, again, from what I remember correctly, a lot of people gave her the same sort of guff, the same issue as they did with Angelina Jolie. Um, from what I remember... And what I've talked about when I spoke to Atlanta Jolie, Joe Lee, she got loads of issues. Like she doesn't look like her. Um, she doesn't have the breast size, blah, blah, blah. All these silly sort of male, masculine, stupid things, really. Um, and it was one of those where it was like, I, I remember it being the same for Alicia. People were like, oh, she's too skinny. She can't do this. She can't do that. But breast size, all this stuff. Again, absolute tri trivial, right? It doesn't really matter, really. Um, but I remember that she went up against the lot. And, I, and again, I thought to myself, just give her a go. And she is. And she plays a fantastic, incredible Lara in this. Again, I've only ever watched this movie once. And the reason I've only ever watched it once, if, I, if, I being, if I'm being honest, is the fact of, one, I've been really, really busy. Because when it came in 2018, um, I, was going, I was from college going to uni. So I was really busy with that. Also, I enjoyed it that much that I was like, well, I, I can't wait for a sequel. Um, and I've been waiting all this time for a sequel. And I talk about the sort of troubled problem the sequel had or potential sequel. Um, but I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and that's why I've only ever watched it once. And that's why I'm so excited to watch it again, because I remember just having such positive uh, feelings about it, uh, liking it so much and wondering as to why it never got a sequel, why it's a movie that just came and went. Um, and again, I've, I've noticed this as we've talked about Lara Croft, uh, with this sort of series so far is the fact of, you know, everybody remembers like the first Tomb Raider movie, Angelina Jolie, but nobody remembers the sequel so much. Um, and the movies do well, but they don't do well enough. And it's one of those where you have to ask yourself the question, why are they not doing so well? What is it about Lara Croft where, you know, um, people will go to see them, but not everybody wants to go see them, no matter how good they look or seem or how practical they do these like stunts and things like that in, in the movies. Um, why is it that people aren't going for the adventure? And I've always wondered that myself. And that's one thing that I've, in my personal time of watching these movies and reviewing them, I've been trying to figure out. And so far, I, I don't think I can because I'm enjoying them. And a lot of people that I speak to, and again, like I said, the positive response, all the people uh, that say to me, oh, well, they loved it. They love Lara Croft. Like I said, I'm a huge Lara Croft fan. Um, I don't understand why it's not, been overly positive why people don't go out in droves to go see these movies um especially like when you look at the behind the scenes stuff which i'll talk about in a minute and you see all the practical um stuff they went through they they built all the sets um as much as possible they um alicia vikander did all her own stunts she actually worked out um did a huge huge workout routine and did a lot of her own stunts and like all the practical things all the fighting all the stuff with the bows like it's one of those where i actually before i did this review or well, started reviewing it anyway, started like writing it and doing that. I actually went back onto YouTube and I recommend to do anybody to do this who's interested in this movie, who's interested in behind the scenes stuff. Um, 
look at some of the behind the scenes of the making of this movie and you better see Elisa Vikander actually working out, doing all of her own practical uh, scenes, all the practical sets, filming on location. I've spoken about it many times before. No matter how good CGI is, unless um, it's sort of top of the line and you know, you're talking about arm and a leg, it's not going to age well, it's not going to look well. Whereas if you can do the practical, all the practical stuff yourself, and if you can get the actor to do a lot of the stunts themselves, it makes it feel more intense. It makes it feel more real because they're not cutting away to somebody else. They're cutting to, say, Elise Vikander fighting or she's like running on, on a on a plane wing as it's trying to fall down a waterfall, that sort of thing. It's all sort of like she's there, she's doing it. It's all real. Um and yeah, I, I'm just gushing about this movie at the moment. I haven't really properly talked into the development, but I just don't understand why it didn't do very well. That's what sort of confuses me. But hopefully when we get talking to, into development and we start looking at the actual review of it and I start sort of breaking it down um, later, we can try and figure that out um, ourselves. But, you know, we will see. As for development, this one was a bit difficult because it was really hard to find things to talk about this film in terms of development because everywhere I look, um, I couldn't find a lot, to be honest. So I've tried my best to bring together as much as I can find in terms of development, which is not a lot. Whenever you review, try to look for anything about this movie, I found all I was getting was results for the Tomb Raider video games. Um which is great, but I don't want to look at them at the moment. So that was sort of the difficulty. But what I could find, I've tried to condense as much as possible, but there's not much there to condense, really. So um, in 2007, Warner Brothers Pictures purchased film rights for Paramount from Paramount Films as a turnaround for potential film reboot four years after Angelina Jolie stepped down as Lara Croft from the last movie. With Metro Goldwyn Mayer also purchasing half of it in 2009, um, GK Films had also acquired the rights to make the film in 2011, with Eva MGM and Warner Brothers to distribute. Initially, Megan Fox, Jennifer Lawrence, and Eliz- uh, Olivia Wilde and Mia Kunis were originally rumoured to portray Lara Croft, but all had declined. Deadline Hollywood had also reported that Daisy Ridley had, was considered for the role, but Ripley later described it as the craziest rumour she had ever heard about herself. Norwegian director Ro Ugach, I feel like I'm pronouncing that wrong, if I am, I do apologise, as Ugath, Ugath, um, came on board in November 2015, and Alicia Vikander was cast as the new Lara Croft in April 2016. Walter Goggins was announced to play the villain in December 2016 and much of the rest of the cast was revealed in early 2017. Um, the, again, that's all I've got for the uh, for development. As for film, and again, even less, Prince of Photography began um, on January the 23rd, 2017 in Cape Town, South Africa and wrapped on June the 9th, 2017 at Warner Brothers Studios at Levensten in Herefordshire, England, uh, Wilton House near Salisbury in Wiltshire was the location for the exterior shots for Croft Manor. The waterfall sequence involving the plane was filmed at a water park at Lee Valley outside London at a venue that had been built for the 2012 Summer Olympics and was combined with footage filmed in South Africa. That is a lot in terms of development, as much as I can find. Um, th- there wasn't really much else, um, to be honest. So what I have thought I would do because 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 I couldn't find much on the development, I want to talk about sort of. I know we haven't talked about the review that, and I should really leave this so I do the review. But I thought it'd be interesting to mention it now, um, before we get into the review, um, because I feel like it's one of those that needs to be talked about. Um, so I was going to talk about sort of the cancelled sort of sequel, the potential future, right? So in two thousand and fifteen. Um, Adrian Askery, producer of the Hitman film, stated that he hoped to oversee a shared universe of Square Enix films with Just Cause, Hitman, Tomb Raider, Deus Ex and Thief, but admitted that he did not have the rights to Tomb Raider. Before the release of the first film, Alicia Vikander expressed interest in returning as Lara Croft for a second film, stating that if there's an audience out there for it, then I would love to. In April 2019, Amy Jump was hired to write a script for a possible sequel with a candor attached. In September 2019, Ben Whitley, Jump's husband, signed on to direct the sequel with a planned March 
nineteenth to uh, planned nineteenth March nineteenth. 2021 release date with Warner Brother Pictures dropping out of the project. It was produced, um, it was announced that filming would start in early 2020 in England. According to Geek Vibes Nation, principal photography was scheduled to start in April with filming taking place across several countries, including England, South Africa, Finland, and China, and looking to deliver a faithful adaptation of the game's story. But Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, production was delayed with filming due to take place in England and South Africa and the film was removed from the studio's release schedule. In January 2021, um, Misha, Misha Green signed to replace Jump and Wheatley respectively as writer and director, with the latter moving on to direct Meg 2, The Trench, for Warner Brothers pitches instead. The film was going to be released theoretically in the US via Metro Gold Mayer's distribution and marketing joint venue with United Arts releasing and internationally through Warner Bros. Pictures. In May 2021, Misha Green confirmed via her official Twitter account that the first draft of the script with the working title Tomb Raider Obsidian had been completed. In July of the same year, Vikander told Collider that the sequel was still set to be made, but had not yet been greenlit. In September this year, Green responded to a fan's question about the sta- status of the film on her Twitter account, indicating that she was still set to direct her own script. In July 2022, it was reported that MGM had lost the film rights to Tomb Raider franchise after the window in which to give the sequel the greenlit ran out, culminating in Vikander's departure from the lead role. During this time, the rights reverted to its original game companies, Idris and Crystal Dynamics, which were later acquired by the Embracer Group in the third quarter of 2022, um, prompting a bidding war among other film studios, right? So, yeah, a lot of st- like there was a planned sequel for this movie that there was going to be another one, but due to COVID and other people having to uh, be moved off the project and other people coming on to to write things and that the movie wasn't greenlit in time and MGM lost the rights, it went. It's 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 one of those where it's the fact of it feels like if it was against this movie that people wanted to make it, but they, like God or the universe or whatever you want to call it was against it and was like, no, put, keep pushing it back. It's not going to happen. And sadly, we will never get a sequel to this film because MGM um, no longer has the rights and Alicia Vikander has, has moved on to other projects, which is a shame. But there is a sort of um, sort of light at the end of the tunnel. You know, there is a positive to this, right? So, um, in January 2023, MGM's sister company, Amazon Studios, secured the rights to a new Tomb Raider film with Dimitri M. Johnson and his company, DJ2 Entertainment, attached to produce. The film is intended to be interconnected with a television series being developed by Phoebe Waller-Bridge and a video game from Crystal Dynamics, forming a Tomb Raider shared universe. So the future is bright in terms of... Um, Tomb Raider and what is to come in terms of films and series. I know Netflix this year is releasing a um, animated series with Lara Croft. With to be honest, one of my absolute favourite um, actors of all time, and is one of the actual um, is one of the. Hold on, where is it? Let me find. I'm actually going to Google it now. Hold on. So she she is one of the sort of characters, one of the actors, sorry, who I said would make a perfect Lara Croft. And I still stand by today that I still think that if they did a um, a live action Lara Croft, that she would be a perfect Lara. And that's Hayley Atwell. Hayley Atwell is doing the voice for Lara Croft in this animated um, series. I think it's called Lara Croft, the legend of Lara, uh, Tomb Raider, the legend of Lara Croft. She's doing the voice. Um, and that comes out later this year and I will be reviewing that. Um, so I am looking forward to seeing like her as Lara or her voice even. And I hope that if it's successful, they might go, you know what? We'll bring her on for live action because I feel like she could do a live action Lara. I really, really do. I've seen some people do some art about what they like, what they think her, what she, what they think she would look like in live action if she was as Lara, um, and it looks really good. 
So, you know, fingers crossed, we might get that, we might not. But yeah, that is all I have really to say, to be honest, um, for the introduction. I am incredibly excited for this one. I love Lara Croft. Um, and again, like I said, I've only ever seen this movie once. So it's one of those where I'm excited to see what this film is like after all these years of having, I haven't seen it since 2019. So it's been a while since I've last seen this film. So it would be nice to go back and, and to watch it and to experience it all again and to talk about it with you all. So without further ado, I'm going to go off and watch Tomb Raider. Um, and I will see you in a minute. <laughs> Right, so I've not long finished watching the movie. And honestly, my first impressions, uh, this is my second time watching it, it's really, really good. And it's that good that it's a genuine shame. Like, I genuinely felt deflated at the end of it. I felt like Woody from Toy Story 2. I think I've used this analogy a couple of times, where, like, he's watching uh, Woody's Roundup with the Roundup gang, with Sticky Pete and bullseye and the whole lot and then he goes okay next episode and then the show was cancelled after that um and that's how i feel i felt really defeated i feel like woody it's like the fact of that was epic that was fantastic it was really really good let's watch the next one because it ends on the cliffhanger and then nothing crickets and and obviously as i mentioned in the introduction we we talked about as to why the movie didn't get a sequel and it's a real shame because this is really, really good. It's epic. It's extraordinary. It's very great. It's well acted. Uh, it's well cast. Uh, the production is, is incredible. The set design, the practical effects, the um, sort of uh, the practical effects, uh, not just done by, you know, what you can see visually, but also the fact of the stunts. Elise Vikander does all, all her own stunts and you can tell it's her in every scene. It's incredible really really is and it's just a crying shame that nobody went out to see this movie and it's not just this one as again i mentioned in the introduction when you look back at the other Lara croft movies where you look at um you know the Lara croft and you look at the cradle of life you look at the, those films and they did well for the time but not many people went out to see them and it's the same here it's the fact of this movie did well just not well enough and it's a shame. And um, I still can't wrap my head around why any of these movies didn't do well enough. I know the last film they got a sequel, but I just can't see as to why we're not seeing more Lara Croft projects. It seems now things are changing in a way as we're having the Tomb Raider, uh, Lara, um, the Lara Croft from Netflix is coming um, with Hayley Atwell, which again, I mentioned, I'm really, really excited for that. And then we also have like the Amazon uh, movie sort of series that they want to do, which I'm really glad for. But it just seemed for a, a long time where just people just weren't interested in, in Lara Croft. And as a huge fan of her and the games, I just, I could never really wrap my head around it and more so now. Um, so yeah, my first impressions is this movie is really, really good. And if you haven't watched it, um, stop listening to me. Uh, go give it a go. Go watch it. It's on Amazon Prime. You can easily pick it up somewhere for the cheap on DVD. Um, it'll be on streaming somewhere as well. Just like go give it a go. Go give it a watch. It is generally a lot of fun. It's almost it's almost close to being two hours long, thereabouts. Um, but the time passes so quickly. There is so, so many epic moments that you're on the edge of your seat. You're interested. You're invested. Well, I was anyway. Um, in the character, in the story, that those two hours or thereabouts um, flies by. And that by the end of it, you're left wanting more. And if you're a fan like I am, you, you'd be a bit bummed out that we never get any more in this universe anyway with this Lara, which is a shame. But yeah, my first opinion overall, really, really good. I really enjoy it and I can't recommend it enough. Um, it is better than I remember it being. Um, and that should give you a big enough sort of uh, idea of how good this film is that it's better than i remember um alicia Vikander as lara uh, she's perfect as a young lara she plays the character really really well I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more in in the trivia um but she put on a lot of muscle mass you know she put on a lot uh, she bulked herself up she worked out uh, for for months to get herself in the right shape for Lara for this role, just so she could do some of her own stunts. And it 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 shows because Lara 
like her dad when if you want to go back into the history of Lara, not just in this movie, but the history of Lara, um obviously the original story of Lara Croft is a bit different to sort of the retelling when it was changed. But sort of on the retelling version of the story, um her father sort of brought her up and prepared her for you know, not just the wide world, but prepared for adventure, prepared for um, things that are to come, basically, because obviously he knew what was to come and he knew uh, sort of the evil organisations and the sort of work he was doing and he was preparing her uh, to get ready for that. So he would leave her puzzles. He would um, teach her how to how to fence, how to fight, how to defend herself, how to shoot a bow, that sort of thing. And um, it helped her then sort of grow up so when he was gone, she would be capable on her own and then she sort of evolved into the Tomb Raider. Um, so you would expect that Lara as a character would be somebody who is athletic, who is um, capable of all different types of um, uh, sort of activities where it would be like rock climbing, uh, parasailing, uh, hand-to-hand combat to an extent, you know, some sort of karate um, or, tai- or sort of Muay Thai, something like that, you know. And so this is the thing I'm trying to get is the fact of she looks like Lara. You expect what a young Lara should look like. Somebody who is athletic, somebody who can literally do anything. Um, somebody who can speak loads of different languages, who is um, uh, highly capable being. And Alicia Vikander, she really sells that. She looks capable, even that there are moments where she, you can tell that she's in her own head, that she... Um, almost has no, no idea what she's doing or seems like she has no what she's doing she still finds a way out and around it um, and i really really like that so to know that alicia wanted to dedicate uh you know putting herself through all that sort of um turmoil and strife with actually working out day in day out to make sure that she portrays the character right i cannot 100 percent, you know i can't fault that and i 100 percent sort of support it you know um so for that sort of side of it I absolutely love and I think is absolutely fantastic. And again, most importantly, she reminds me of the um, video game version of Lara, which is actually the huge sort of inspiration for uh, this Lara and this story, which again, I'll get onto that in a minute. But yeah, at least for Kanda as Lara, perfect. She deserves her spot in the line of uh, movie Lara's. Obviously, I know at the moment it's just Angela Jolie and um, Alicia, but she deserves a spot on that pedestal because she plays the character um, so fantastically in this. And it, again, it comes back to what I was saying. It's a shame that she never got a chance to uh, sort of push the character further, to go in a, to take it further, to, to be a lot more capable Lara. Because um, by the end of this movie, the Lara that we get is a Lara that is ready for an adventure. She is ready for what is to come. Um, and I would have liked to see uh, a Lara, maybe if the next movie was set a year or two, or even three years later, where she is a lot more sort of mature. She's, she's done a lot more adventures. She has raided a lot more tombs. So when you see her, she has she's a lot more badass. She's a lot sort of um, stronger minded. Um, because one of, the, one of my favorite moments in the video game is that they do it here in this, is the fact of, um, and I'm, there's going to be a lot of back and forth with the video game, because again, it was hugely inspired. Um, this story was from the first sort of video game by Square Enix that came out like 2012, I think. Um, one thing that I loved in that game that they do really well in this is the fact of Lara's first kill. So in the game, Lara, again, she goes out to... Um, find to basically follow in her father's footsteps really to find this island of yamatai to solve this mystery she gets shipwrecked and um her crew gets captured she gets sort of separated and she has to go find them we've been going to find them there is a moment where she where she has her first kill where she first kills another person um and it's very brutal it's very hard to watch it's very difficult and it should be because taking a life is not an easy thing. Obviously, I sound like I'm talking from experience. Obviously, I'm not. Um, but it shouldn't be an easy thing. It should be difficult. It should be really hard for a human to take another human's life. Um, and they managed to do that scene perfectly in the film where you've got Lisa Vikander. She's fighting for her life. Um, she is. She's obviously scared. She's terrified. But she's like, it's me or this person. So she kills uh, she kills them eventually. And it's it's hard. It's brutal. It's really hard to watch. But Alicia sells that scene so well 
that I just wish that scene was a little bit longer because it was so powerful and it was so strong, not just to the character, but to the overall sort of yeah, arc of Lara that, um, yeah, it was, it was just really, really powerful, really, really well done. And again, it's just a shame that she never got a chance to carry that on. You know what I mean? Like, there wasn't an opportunity to, to see more of this iteration of the character. Um, then sort of we're moving on to sort of Walt Goggins as Matthias, as the villain. He's on another level. Now, we all know now how good Walt Goggins is as an actor. He is a chameleon, right? Um, he can just sort of disappear in any role into any um, film, even if he's a back if he's even if he's a background character, he's not a main character. You remember him. He's just one of them actors of just like, look, I don't remember the movie, but I remember this guy. You know, he's one of my favorite ver- parts of like the film Predator. A great movie. I liked it. Again, another one of those moments where not a lot, not many people went to go watch it. But he was in that movie and he plays a convict, right? Um, and he has some of the best lines in that film. Um, and there are there's so many different films that he's in and TV shows that when he appears, you just remember him. And like, like I said, us hardcore fans, us movie fans, I've always known how good of an actor he is. I'm glad now people are starting to realize how good of an actor he is and starting to go back and to watch his filmography and to check him out. Um, thanks to like his, his role as the ghoul in Fallout. Even my dad, who recognized him but didn't really know who he was, loved him so much in The Ghoul that when he appears in movies now, he's like, oh my God, that's, you know, The Ghoul. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, he's incredible. So we all know how much of uh, an actor he is he's, he's on another level and him as Matthias here is is incredible because um he's a man on a mission he is a man determined to solve this mystery on this island to get home but he's been there seven years you know he's had nobody really else to talk to apart from his men and sort of the slaves that he has um trying to f- break their way into this tomb and he's on his own. So you can imagine he's got his way from home. He's, he's a bit crazy. He, he's, he's losing his mind a bit. And there are moments where he feels sane, where he feels clever. He feels smart. He feels like, like a genius, really. And then you have moments where he just loses it. And you just have that look in his eye, that glazed look in his eye of just like, I just don't care. Like, I would do whatever it is I have to do to get back home to my little girls, really. Um and he's such an uh, he's he's taken a character that could really just could have been one note could have been an, an easy character just for any actor to um not give a go really just kind of phone it in um but he took that character and then just pushed it to another level um and again it's Walt Goggins he makes every role great he makes every role memorable um this is why people keep having him and he keeps appearing in films and TV shows because where you know if you get Walt Goggins um he's going to make whatever role you give him 10 times better. And that in itself is, is incredible. So he's him taking on the role of Matthias and this was so good. Um, and it, again, he had some funny lines in this. There's a line when they're doing a puzzle and, um, the, the, the floors dropping from the bottom of them and Lara's trying to solve it. And then, like they're all saying, which one should we do? Which one? He's like, just use all of them. It doesn't really matter. Like, and then so Lara's trying all different combinations. And he goes, look, I'm losing floor here. And it's like most like this where it, he's, he's putting comedy and humor into a situation where you wouldn't expect it. Um, where it's not really needed, but it's, it's welcomed, you know? Um, and again, I don't know if it was in the script or it was sort of something that he was ad-libbing and doing, um, as sort of in this in the moment, but they they work, um, and it's just these moments that make me just love him so much as an actor, and why whenever um, he makes a movie or TV show, no matter what it is, if I'm interested or not, if he's in it, I will watch it, you know, and that is acting power, um, that not many actors have nowadays, really, um, and he's just one of those. That I'm glad people are starting to no- take notice of him now, um. But yeah, Walt Goggins as the villain, as Matthias, on another level, incredible. Um, as for the story, like I said, the story sort of, um, it, it it's its own self-contained story for the most part, especially for the beginning. Um, but mostly it copies and takes inspiration from the 2000 and 
2012 um, reboot video game, Tomb Raider, um, which is a great place to start, to be honest, because that movie's fantastic. I mean, that game's absolutely incredible. I really, really, lo- I really love playing that game, and I can't wait to cover it, to be honest. Um, but the story that we get here, so like if I, if I was to chop it in half into two, into two sections, the first half of the story is, is very much set uh, in London, where Lara, she, um, you kind of experience Lara before so she becomes the Tomb Raider really that her father's gone um she doesn't really have any well she's got money but she doesn't really have it doesn't really want it doesn't have nothing to do with the whole croft name um and that she is a courier through through uh london and that she she's just trying to get on with life now that her dad's been missing for seven years kind of like she's on her own um and that she gets a chance an opportunity to sort of go on this adventure that she realizes that her father is alive and that she wants to retrace his footsteps. And then from there, she realizes that her dad was more than just a businessman, that there was, he had a second life that she never knew about, that he was a, a tomb raider, basically. He, well, it's never given that name, but in a way, like he was like an Indiana Jones or tomb raider sort of person. He was like an archaeologist. He went around looking for mysteries. And he was looking for uh, Yamatai, uh, this island that was in the Devil's Triangle. That um, the legend is that the the Queen of Death uh, was taken there by her guards, was forced there um, so that she could be taken away so that the world could heal. Because everywhere she went, there'd be death and destruction. um, And that um, she needed to be locked away forever so that... um, she could no longer spread her death among uh, her people and the rest of the world. Um, and the story is kind of the same in the game. In the game, she's more of a god, and a literal god, that being said. Um, and they, obviously they changed that for the movie. But again, I'll talk about sort of the mystery a little bit later. But sort of the overall story here for the parts that, you know, the parts where like you get an introduction to who Lara is, and it really sets it up because... You need to know, you can't just, can't like, like the game, the game just begins, like you just start, you're on a boat, you have a cut scene, and the next thing you know, you're on the island, boom. In this one, you need to set the character up, you need to set up who Lara is, what she stands for, why she went out looking for her father, where her father is, is he alive, is he dead, how long has he been missing, blah, 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 blah. You know, you've got to set that all up. And, and so the first half does a fantastic job of setting that all up. My favorite part of this movie is the second half, is that when she goes to Hong Kong, when she charters a boat and that she finds, um, from fo- looking through her father's documents, she finds these um, sort of receipts from this man, uh, Lou Ren, who uh, promised that he would, if he paid 20,000 US dollar, uh, he will tr- take uh, Richard Croft off to this island. So she follows the trail, gets his boat, finds Lou Ren Jr., uh, the man's son, um, and basically goes, Look, I'll pay you money. We'll go find out what happened to our dads. And then we get to the island. And this is where it feels like the video games. There's, there are moments and scenes almost directly from uh, the video games, um, which is incredible. The influence and the differences between the games and story um, is really, really interesting because, like I said, the, the beginning, not so much. The second half, a lot. So, like, like for example, the practical effects and sort of the set design, they're very much the same. Like for, when you have this moment where Lara, she is escaping from Matthias and his men and she's going down the rapids and she manages to cling on to this wreckage of this plane that is somehow teetering on the end of a waterfall. It's all rusted. It's been there a long, long time. It hasn't moved for even, I'm sure there's been loads of storms and I'm sure things have hit it and it's never moved. But now Lara Croft is there. She touches it. She jinxes the whole thing. And all of a sudden, for some unknown reason, it starts to rust and fall apart and she has to escape from it. And if I watch, if you watch the back of the behind the scenes sort of footage, which I have because I'm a big nerd, um, they actually did that physically. Like, so a lot of that was done physical and practically and only a bit of it obviously was done the rest sort of the background stuff was done cgi but mostly all that was practical effects and you cannot sort of you can't sit here and not respect that more when you know that and then you look at this and it it looks like 
so real because it's, it mostly is. And it, going back to Alicia Vikander, she's doing her own stunts. It, it's actually her. You know it's her. You can see her face. There's no bad CI trying to sort of put her face onto um, a stunt lady's face. No, this is mostly all Alicia doing it herself. Alicia and the rapids. Alicia doing all the climbing and jumping and stuff like that. Which she. This is why she feels so much like Lara because you can actually see her face. You can see her in the role of like, yeah, she actually is in danger. She actually is jumping um, uh, from a rusted old plane to some rocks to for safety, or she jumps out of, a, uh, out of this plane with a parachute and she brutally, like the games are brutal. Um, and so is this movie, like brutally, she is going, hanging on to this um, parachute and she just goes through a thicket of trees and she just gets cut up and she falls and she gets, um, I think something pals her in her side. Um, and it's, it's just one of those where it's like, it's brutal and it's so effective. So like the, the influence and the differences in that respect work fantastic. And then you get to like Yamatai, like sort of the deaf queen's tomb. And it's so, the architecture is gorgeous. And the, and the whole set piece, it's all epic and grand. And it makes me wish I could have seen it on a, on a huge cinema screen because it's just so perfectly done. It looks exactly out of the video games and it's done so well here. And the, even though they've changed things about what the, the Death Queen was and all of that, because obviously in the video games, um, they take one of her friends from the crew because she happens to have some resemblance to this queen and that uh, the that then the dead queen then um how can i explain it basically possesses this girl and tries to put her essence into this young woman so, so that she can kind of rise again and rule the world um that's the video game this one the mystery here is a bit better but again i don't want to get into that just yet um but the difference is um, not in the first half, not really there, but the second half, they are there completely. And I love it for that. I love the, the differences where it was like, look, we are taking uh, huge references from the video game, but we're going to try something new. We're going to try and tell this story in our own way, in our own tale. And for that, again, I can respect it highly. Um, the puzzles as well. There's a puzzles in here. Uh, one I, I chose as an example is, as I mentioned earlier, with what will Goggins sort of joking around is the life and death color puzzle um so basically they're in this little area and it's the many faces um of yamatai um and they as they go through they get to the very end and one of the guards accidentally triggers the puzzle but if you ever know one thing that you notice and again i'll talk about this when we get to the mystery is that the trigger for the puzzle is not at the beginning of the trap it's at the end of the trap or sort of the Entrance depends on which way you're going. Again, I'll, I will explain it in a minute. Um, but this puzzle is really well done because Lara, there's these prayer stones underneath these pictures and that she has to move the different prayer stones over and behind them are like different color crystal sort of shapes. And you have to use the different colors together, put them together to make a, uh, make a color. And that if you can get these two different puzzles uh, pieces together and put it in a slot they will turn around lock and that the door will open and the floor will stop sort of falling to pieces and the set and and, and the idea and the concept behind it is really is really great and funny yeah you have um sort of what goggins's characters there you've got the other mercenaries there obviously nameless mercenaries one by one they try to hold on but they don't they fall through and die um and Use another character there, which I don't really want to talk about. But there's another character there, um, and this whole puzzle—it feels like the video game. Like you are, you're up against the clock. Like if you don't solve it in time, Lara's going to die. Everybody's going to die. So I like how they incorporate a, a puzzle um, into this. Like La the Angelina Jolie movies had them, so I'm glad that they at least put one big puzzle in it. There was there was another puzzle as well, small things here and there, but this was like the biggest one um and i really sort of respect that they put it in um as for the uh, sort of the mystery that i've been sort of teetering at um there there is a say underlying sort of quote that keeps getting mentioned in the story um is that all mystery all mysteries have an element of fact which is a, a true thing it's one thing that i always think of myself as somebody who loves history somebody who loves um tall tales and myths that you know for a lot of people people say oh this couldn't have happened that couldn't have happened well 
like I said, all mystery have an element of fact um, and that it might have not happened exactly how it was happened in the story, but something happened in the vein of that, like the story of Troy, for example. For a long time, people thought that the story of Troy um, didn't happen. It was just a story, that it, it wasn't something that um, was a real battle, it was a real thing, until somebody read it and went, well, there's some truth here, you know, I'll follow the clues and eventually follow the truths, true, uh, the, uh, follow the tales and follow some of the truths, sorry. And eventually they found um, the city, the lost city of Troy. And it was proven that that story, even though we can't tell if the whole story was true, we know that it's true because we found the lost city. Um, and that's just one example. And there's been loads of us through time and history, really. But there is always fact to mystery to a myth and here the differences are different like i said in the game she's a god in this one um she is a carrier she is somebody who has a I, I, but they never really explain it if it's it's some sort of disease whether it should be genetic or she caught it or if it's a whole family has it it's just a thing but um, and they never give a name to what it is, but I'm just going to call it the Black Death. I'm just going to call it the plague because it, it'd be easier just to explain it. But basically, she had this plague. She had this disease that if you touched her or she touched you, um, you would instantly start getting ill. Um, you it would take instant effect. You know, there'd be no time waiting. As soon as you touched her, it'd be like kind of like venom. Really, you'd have like black stuff go up your arms and inside your body, and um, it would go up your face and just turn you all black and go right into your veins. And it kind of like turns you into a zombie, really, is that once you've turned, um, your next sort of protocol, your next sort of move is that to spread so that you look for the next person that's not infected and you would jump on them, you try to touch them, bite them, cut them any way you can, and that they would get infected and then they would turn and the next thing would happen there. And I don't want to spoil sort of the, the surprise of this mystery um but i like the what they went with here is that this you you didn't just get to have the mystery but they also lara also solves the mystery by looking around at the murals on the wall that's around this tomb and she can and it tells the story of what really happened and um i like that i also like the fact if you get to see the actual disease itself take form and what happens and then when you sort of take that into respect once you take the mystery and then when lara sort of reveals the mystery and then you get to see the disease and what it does to people and again how it makes them somewhat like zombified sort of thing um then the traps start making sense because they go through a lot of traps as they come in but a lot of the traps are not um sort of they're, they're kind of how can I explain it? Like you see it when they first go in, there's a body and there's a person or skeleton even that has a hole just right at the top of its head. Um, and then you, there's no thing there that you'd say, well, how did that happen? Like, did somebody blow his head off? Well, they could not because they had no, they didn't have guns back then. So what happened? Um, and as they go on, one of the mercenaries sets off a trap and then sparks come up through the floor and it goes, and you, you do see it, not graphically, graphically, but you do see it. It goes straight through his, through his skull out the top of his head and that answers the question well obviously he must have trod, he or she must have trod on one of those that skeleton um and that was what happened to them um and again it's same with that puzzle as i mentioned as they enter they they are all standing around not one of them sets off a booby trap at the beginning you think a booby trap would be right at the beginning but it wasn't the booby trap was at the end of the puzzle at, at the other end of the door so once you put all those things in, into effect and you have other things, other traps, you've got huge chasms full of dead bodies and things like that. When you put it all into effect, you actually realize that all the traps weren't made to keep people out. It was to keep people in so that um, I would imagine that her men, uh, the, the Deaf Queen's men, um, and maybe servants, another Pete and workers, whatever, anybody that came in contact with her was sealed in as well because they were a chance of being infected. Um, so that I would imagine that anybody who was infected when it was sealed, that if they tried to escape, that they would get killed, that they would set off a trap um, and they would die. And um, when you realize that, it puts another level 
on Twitter. Again, it's never mentioned. It's never something that is said, oh, these traps are not meant for us. It's, it's, there's little hints here and there, but it's, you, it's up for you as, as the Tomb Raider, as sort of the watcher, um, to kind of figure out yourself. And I like to think of like that is a puzzle for the audience, um, a puzzle for the audience to figure out, to realize, look, these traps aren't for Lara. They aren't for Walter Goggins, Matthias, and any of everybody else who would come in here. It's to stop anybody who's infected from getting out. That's what they're there for. Um, and then, like I said, when you realize that, it just makes the, the whole um, moment and whole mystery just 10 times better. In, in my opinion, like I said, I, I don't, I'm not going to ruin the twist to the mystery. Um, I'll just say it's, it's a disease, but again, that's mentioned at the beginning of the film, but the twist of that mystery, I really, really like. And even though, again, we'll talk about sort of the twist ending in a minute, even though that we'll never get a sequel, it's still that good of a twist um, that I don't really want to ruin it for anybody, for anybody who hasn't watched it. I want some people to go off who hasn't seen this film um, to go give it a go. To give it a watch to to try it because the twists and the turns and the whole mystery over overarching is really really well done um so you've got the twist of the mystery um and then you have sort of the twist ending where the things start to come together that the um over sort of the the background sort of characters the gra- background mentions start to come into it and then we get the twist ending of trinity um and if, if you don't know who Trinity is, uh, Trinity is a organization, um, a religious organization. Um, they're in the video games as well. But the long and short of it, they're a, a religious organization that deal with the supernatural, deal with the macabre. They are the organization, kind of like the Illuminati. Um, they are basically people who try to go and find mysteries and take whatever these mysteries are. So the idea of like the Ark of the Covenant um, or somebody who lives forever. Uh, why, why do they live forever? It, uh, what's that power? How can we make use of it? How can we take it and use it for ourselves? So it's very for evil, for um, nefarious reasons. It's the same with Yamatai and the Queen of Death. Um, they wanted to take whatever this disease was, whatever this thing that was killing all these people, and to take it and to weaponize it and to sell it and blah, blah, blah. blah. So this sort of revelation of who Trinity was uh, is very, is great and very, very well done. Again, it's just a shame that we never get to to do anything with it. That we've, we've it's hinted throughout of of Trinity, and there's a, a company called Perna, um, who is a sub subdivision of Trinity, and you get to see Perna boxes everywhere uh, where Matthias Matthias camp is, um, and that's who he's working with. And he even says, like, look, I have a phone that's a one way phone um, that only talks to one person on the other end of the line. Um, and again, I won't spoil the twist. I won't go into more detail than I already have. Um, and again, even like I said. We will never get a sequel, so I should be able to talk about it. But again, I want people to watch this film because it is uh, that good, so I don't want to ruin the twists. Um, But yeah, the way that Trinity was handled makes me wish that we got more, makes me wish that there was more sequel sequels, that they did more. Because like they did with the games, when you play the games, Trinity is there every step of the way. And again, I won't won't go into spoilers for the games because I will cover them eventually. But the events of what happens in the games and how it, uh, you go from uh, Trinity being like high strength and that their exploits basically being foiled by Lara as the games go on. By the time you get to the last game, they are a shriveled version of themselves. They are very, very desperate. And that's kind of what I would, would have hoped for for sequels is the fact that they're at the strength now, they're at the height of their power, and that as the next two or three or whatever movies, however successful the, the series could have been, um, that you could have saw Trinity get a lot more sort of um, relentless. They got they got a lot more sort of like we're losing assets, we're losing uh, professionals, we're losing people on our side, and it gets to a point where we've got no chance. And maybe the, the last move of the trilogy could have been the last hurrah, and it, it could have been something that you saw Trinity uh, at their wits' end, trying their best to throw everything at the wall to either stop Lara or find this last mystery that's going to redeem them or something like that. That would have been really good. It's Again, it's a shame that we never got it. But I like sort of the twist that we got with Trinity. Um, and finally, one of the last sort of things that we get, we see 
is uh, dual pistols. As it very, very ends, Lyra goes back to the pawn shop where she uh, pawns off her necklace that her father gave her um, so that she could get the money to kind of fund her expedition to go find her father. Um, and at the very at the very end, she she goes back and gets it. She looks in the back, she sees some weapons, um, and then she sees sort of uh, these dual magnum sort of pistols, and she holds them up to the camera, and, and, and that's basically it, really. Um, and it, it's a shame. It really is because, like I said, this movie is really, really good. It's it's very well done. Uh, the the actors and uh, not just uh, um, Elisa Vikander, but all the other actors that I didn't mention. You know the 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 man who plays Richard Croft, Lara's father, does a fantastic job. Uh, what Goggins is an, is an inc- absolutely outstanding, incredible villain. And the mystery and the puzzles and the practical effects and the set design. Um, and sort of the adaptation, the differences between the, the game and the, the movie, at sometimes they're almost line for line seamless. Um, I do wish that we had a lot more time on the island than what we did get, but I understand that the first half of the movie has to basically set up the overarching world of Lara and the well, this world of Lara as well as Lara Croft as the character and where she is and um, where she will be going eventually if they made more movies. Um, so again, like I said, it's a shame that we just didn't get any more. Um, and that's kind of another reason why I haven't really gone into much detail of spoiling any of the the mystery and mystery twists um, or that twist ending, because I want people to go out and watch it. I want people who haven't experienced this movie to get to experience it, to experience those, um, those moments for themselves organically and, to, oh, I want other people to realize just how good of a film this is, and that it, that it was worth watching, and that only if people had gone to watch it, we would have got more. But you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Who's to say um, if that they made more of these, that we would now be getting you know the Hayley Atwell, um, Amazon uh, Netflix show, or if we'd be getting the the Amazon movie and and TV show? Would we be getting them now? Who knows? Um, because obviously. Amazon probably wouldn't have bought the studio that had the rights to Lara Croft. So MGM probably would have kept them. So who knows? We probably would have had more movies. And if they would have been good or bad, again, it's it's neither here nor, neither here or nor there to mention it. Um, but yeah, it would have just been nice to see what would happen next. Um, like I said, hindsight being what it is, we can't predict what could have happened. But... I'm just glad that we're now getting more Lara content. You know, there are hints at a new game and you've got the Netflix show, you got Amazon doing stuff and Amazon with their budget. Hopefully they actually put a lot of care and dedication into it. Um, like they did with the fallout show. Like there, there, there are things there for the fans and things there to bring people in. And of course I will be watching and reviewing uh, all things that come out Lara in the future. So, if you like what I've covered so far for Lara Croft, trust me, there will be more to come when more things come out. As well as I've got, a, I've got a, now I've done all the films. I've got to now cover the games. So this train uh, hasn't ended yet. There is a lot more Lara to come. Um, but before we get into wrapping things, when we come to the very, very end, um, a bit of trivia because I love a bit of trivia. Um, so the plot, as I mentioned, is loosely based on the 2013 reboot of the video game series Tomb Raider. Um, it also shares some minor elements of Crystal Dynamics' sequel game, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Yeah, I, I, I kind of liked um, in the Tomb Raider games um, and in this movie as well. At the very end, she kind of gets it. But in the games, they took away her dual pistols and gave her uh, her dual climbing um, axes, pickaxe things. And at the end of this one, she kind of gets that axe back and she gets to use it. Um, and that's kind of her new thing now, her bow and arrow and her climbing axe. And that's basically Lara's new dual pistols, really. Don't be wrong, I really wish that we had dual pistols in the video games because that, again, is, is also a staple of Lara. Um, but I like how they sort of tease them at the end of this movie but they gave us that pickaxe. So I'm glad that they brought that into as well. Um, as uh, Also, sort of Alicia Kander said that it only took three weeks after filming ended to lose all of her muscle mass she gained for the role because um, like, she wanted the character to be as realistic as possible and so that she could do some of her own stunts. It just shows that you put all that work into it, all that work of, of learning how to um, 
basically uh, get all this muscle to to be prepare yourself. You months and months and months and months and months of these different um, sort of schedules and what to eat, what not to eat, when to eat, not what not not when to eat, what, what workouts to do, blah blah blah. You do all that and that you lose it within three weeks it's kind of like the fact of what's the point why the kind of reason why i've never had a six-pack is the fact of i don't mind working out here and there but i don't like i just don't care about having a six-pack because i know once you have it you have to it's really hard to keep um so yeah it's a young men's game not really for me but again this it's it's her dedication to the role it's her dedication to making her look realistic of like, this is what Lara Croft would look like if she was an athletic person that did kickboxing, that did um, Muay Thai, um, who did uh, bow and arrows. Because if you did, if you, if you work with bow and arrows, you need a strong arm and a strong wrist to be able to pull back and release accurately. Um, all these different things. Like if you want to do a realistic telling of Lara, this is what she will have to look like. You know, so you, it's got to be realistic. It's got to look real. So the actor has got to play, look the part as well as act the part, and she does perfectly. Um, Duncan Ali James, Terry the Trainer, is a former six-time world tie and box uh, kickboxing champion and K1 fighter. He's one of the characters you meet at the very, very beginning um, where Lara, she's training uh, kickboxing, and she gets her ass handed to her, and um, he's there. Um, he's one of the sort of the first characters uh, you get to meet um, for this movie. At least for Kanda wanting to play a strong and physically fit Lara Croft, so her goal was to gain enough muscle and strength. What Goggins stated that she's just a real powerhouse. She made me embarrassed to take my shirt off, and I go to the gym five days a week. You know, so that's that's kind of funny. There's also sort of behind the scenes things as well, where um, they'll they'll be on set. What Goggins will be rehearsing his lines, or be reading the book, and then you just got the Felicia kind of there just doing push ups, um, and sit ups and things like that um, during break. So you know, you could tell she really cared. Um, in March 2013, um, MGM announced that they acquired the rights to the Tomb Raider film franchise from Paramount Pictures, who had let their mo- who had let their movie rights expire after Lara Croft. Uh, right after Lara, Lara Croft, Tomb Raider: the, the Cradle of Life failed to find audiences despite being a worldwide success. Um, the old Russian airplane onto which Lara holds that falls down the waterfall is a World War II Japanese heavy bomber known as the Mitsubishi uh, G3M, or the Allies called it the Nell. Which I really, again, that, I love that scene. Um, Lisa Vikander was a fan of the video game series growing up. Um, she put on 12 pounds of muscle. Most of the trivia is all just her gaining muscle, to be honest. Um, again, these are not all my sort of trivia. This is some of the trivia I put in, and a lot of this trivia is on IMDb. Um, so whoever wrote this trivia was like, yeah, she she gained a lot of muscle, bro. Bro, she put a lot of muscle in. Like, we got to make people know that she gained a lot of muscle. Um on the entrance to Lara's father's hidden basement, the inscription indicates that Lara's mother, Amelia Croft, died in 1996. 1996 is the year that the first Tomb Raider game was released. Um, so that's basically some of the some of the highlights, some of the best parts of the trivia. Other parts are mostly just going on about her muscle mass, which yeah, it was great, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> do they really need to, to do so many bits of trivia about it? Probably not, but it is an interesting fact either way. Um, but yeah, uh, like I said, overall, long and short about of it, watch this movie. Give it a go if you haven't already. If you have watched it, go watch it again. Go show support for Lara. And like I said, go watch, go back and watch all the Lara Croft movies. Get yourself ready and get yourself in the mood for more Lara Croft because we've got more to come this year. Uh, the, the Netflix show is later on. I think it's in August, possibly. So it's not very, very far away. Um, I'm looking forward to that. As I mentioned, Hayley Atwell is mm, gorgeous. I love her. Huge fan, huge crush. I can't wait to, to hear her voice um, as Lara. And who knows? It could do it could, the show if people watch it, which I really hope people do. If it does well enough, we might get a live action Lara and she might be the live action Lara for Netflix or Amazon. Who knows? I'll be up for that. I just, yeah, Ooh, great. So get yourself in the mood. Get yourself hyped up for Lara. Go play the games. If you've got Xbox, all the Lara Croft games are on Game Pass. Well, the newer ones anyway. The older ones um, like Underworld and Anniversary and um, Lara Croft. If you want to play them, by all means, they're 
they're on there as well. They're backwards compatible through, uh, but if you got them on Xbox 360, they're always on sale anyway. Um, but they're usually always on sale, so you can play those. Play the older ones, even get your hands on them. The remaster of the first three Lara games are out. Give them a go. And yeah, just just play some more Lara. Get Lara into yourself. Everybody needs a bit of Lara Croft in their life. She is a fantastic character in the video games and in the movies. Um, and it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to watch these films, to talk about them, and to really um, express my love for the character of Lara Croft. She is my all-time favorite video game character. I have played many. I've experienced many different stories. I've got an emotional upset with many different characters. But if I had to pick my top um, character of all time, it's always Lara Croft for me. Because she's just an all-round, perfect, incredible character. And so far, the portrayals in live action have just been perfect angina jolie does a fantastic job and elusive canna does it was a best, best perfect fantastic job so whoever takes on the role next has got some incredibly tough competition um so yeah i am just hyped that we're getting more and i just want people to go out and just play more lara and to watch this film and to watch all the other films and if you haven't listened to more reviews on those movies go back and watch and listen to them too um and yeah Lara Croft, lover, this movie, perfect, just a shame nobody else went to go watch it. But that's all I've got to say, really. Um, thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you for going on me with this journey through Lara Croft. Like I said, it isn't over. I've got all the games to cover. So look forward to seeing them later on in the year. Um, and yeah, so uh, if you listen to this on youtube don't forget to like comment and subscribe if you listen to this on spotify don't forget to leave a star rating and last but not least if you want to keep up to date on everything and anything that i'm doing watching playing and reading and all that jazz then make sure that you follow me on twitter and nerdstagic underscore pod so you be kept up to date with everything and anything that i am doing um i've been your host luke the human you've been listening to the nerdstagic podcast and i will catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.